Uhum. Pontual. Uhum. Ele vai usar o de... Olá, boa tarde. Okay. Nós uh, vamos retomar, então, essa a sessão. Tá? O professor Marcelo Mecânico da... O professor Marcelo Becker, da Engenharia Mecânica, aqui da Escola de Engenharia de São Carlos. Uh, uh, professores Ali e Lili, will you start now uh, with the lecture of professor Marcelo Becker? Ok. Thank you. Um, so, so first, first of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me to come here today. Uh, it's a pleasure to show you some things that we are doing. And uh, as Professor Ana Paula told me that uh, probably most of you are not used to deal with robotics. In the beginning, I'm going to try to give you some ideas what uh, we, are we are researching in this field, okay? So, we are part of the mechatronics group at the uh, engineering school of São Carlos. Um, we have this research group in CNPQ. Here are the guys. Uh, we are five professors today. There are two collaborators from Federal University of São Carlos. And that's me. It's a little biography you can check later because I'm going to generate the PDF file and then later you can get that. Okay. So what we are doing at LabRon, the Mobile Robots Lab, we have some ongoing projects. One of them is related to autonomous cars. The others are more related to agriculture. So it's one focus of our lab there 
is to develop robots for agriculture purpose. And we did some things in the past. Those are basically the robots that we have there. Okay. Uh, we started with uh, small scale robots a few years ago, uh, a, a hybrid car, and then we went to intelligent forklifts, robots for agriculture, drones. This is some things that we are doing in cooperation with Embrapa. And the one that uh, you want to see more things is this one. This project started almost 10 years ago in a collaboration with Fiat Company. And this is one problem that we have in Brazil. Uh, the automakers here don't like to do research that much. To give it the car, it's OK. It's an uh, experimental car, so it's for free for them. But to open the system for us, it's, it's a little bit painful. And this is uh, difficult that we faced. Okay. So for the ones that are not used to deal with robots, a little introduction. We are moving from a situation like this, where all the robots are inside cages. You don't see workers here, because th those robots don't have sensors to detect a person, so they can kill you. If you are there walking, they don't know you are there, and they keep doing the movements, and some accidents can happen. So we are leaving this situation to robots that are more prone to interact with people. Most of this, I think you already know, they were in the news last years. NASA robots that went to Mars, Lego, drones, big drones, very expensive ones used for wars, um, autonomous cars from Google. And this one is very famous. Do you know them? The Romba. So it's very useful. And we are going to these bio-inspired robots, too. All these robots were developed by Festo. It's a German company. Um, up to now, they are very interesting, very beautiful. But very soon, it will be possible for them to embed sensors and more intelligence. So we are changing the way people will interact with robots. Okay? They are not only inside cages anymore in the factories. They are coming closer and closer to us. And this is a challenge for us. OK. Good. Tomorrow, well, so uh, Schwarzenegger was inside the attacks. And that uh, this is a robot driver. OK. So this movie was in the end of 1980s, beginning of 1990s. Well, Star Wars, you know. <laughs> Uh, track, Star Trek, iRobot, but this one I like very much. When I was a student here at USP, that w that's what my mother was asking me every weekend when I was going home. She wanted Rose. And Rose is very useful. She can interact with you, she can clean your house, she can offer you a coffee when you arrive at home wet because it was raining. And she can also tell you that you are not supposed to make a big mess in your home. So she's really nice. And a question. Is it possible for us today to make a rose? What do you think? Just yes, no, yes. The point is, are we prepared to pay the price for a rose? This is the point. If you check uh, on the web, uh, uh, from Hofer in Germany, they have a robot that looks very similar to Rose, but is in development. And before going to the autonomous cars, let me just show you this. This is a iRobot company. It's an American company. They started uh, in the 1990s. It was a MIT spin-off company. And in the beginning, they were working a lot with DARPA. So these robots to deal with bombs or dangerous situations. And in one moment, things changed. They start to make, not rows, but a vacuum cleaner robot. It's easier if you get a big problem and divide into small problems. So that's what they did. And it became a huge success. So the company has 29 years. And uh, I mean, the, the company is 29 years old. 
and they sold more than 25 million home robots in 29 years. So this is amazing what they did. You can go to any supermarket in the U.S. and find the robots from I, robot. Okay. So they divide the problem into smaller problems. So they have robots for to vacuum clean, robots for mopping, robots for to clean swimming pools, to clean the gutter or to cut the grass. And rows, maybe one day they you have one, but the point is the price. And it's the same problem that we are facing with autonomous cars. Okay. Uh, and this will change completely the world that we live. Those are the tendencies uh, that we are facing, the essential aid technology that you need to be ready. Okay. Um, you have them here. So all of you that are very young now, you are going to deal very close to robots, IoT, AR, VR, blockchain, 3D printing, drones, and having this artificial intelligence connecting everything. This is what is going to happen. It's happening now. There's no way to, to avoid it. And when it comes to mobile robots, we can face different environments. When it comes to indoor environments, things are easier because these environments are structured. So it's easier for me to plan a path, plan what is happening around me if you're in the in indoor environment. But when it comes to outdoor environments, they are very dynamic and the tasks are more difficult. When we talk about autonomous cars, we are talking about this kind of environment. So it's not easy to have a robot working in the agriculture scenario or construction. But it's easier to do that in these scenarios than the highways or in urban scenarios. Okay. I will pass fast here just for you to have an idea of how it started. So everything started um, for almost 40 years ago when they were doing this uh, rovers, NASA. You have some uh, robots that became very famous after the accident in Chernobyl. They went to the main reactor to see what was happening some years after the accident. And when it comes to intelligent warehouse, this is very easy. You can do it. You can try bringing down the warehouse. You can find more than two million results. It, this is a very important application for mobile robots because accidents happen there, and it can cost millions. This already happened here in Electrolux more than once. OK. <laughs> so it's in necessary to use uh, smarter mechanical parts to have like uh, this is an omnidirectional robot you can go to any direction it's easier for you to maneuver there and this was uh, the beginning of this company Kiva Systems so this company started many years ago trying to change the way warehouses were working okay so instead of uh, a guy that was working for let's say Amazon getting a list of items that you bought on the web and he was uh, taking a, a cart and checking where the things were in the warehouse, they changed completely. The guy was just in a station and everything he needed was coming to him. It changed completely the way the warehouse started to work. Okay? And it worked so well that Amazon bought it in 2012 and became part of Amazon. Now most of the warehouse of Amazon are working like this. Uh, as I said, you are going to have the PDF file, then you can click here and see the movies. The idea was to give you lots of information so you can become uh, see that uh, robotics is a passion. Okay, uh, another place where you can find many autonomous robots is in harbors. Okay, uh, you have this. Uh, this is in Australia, if I'm not wrong. So this company Kalmar is uh, expert on this field. And uh, in order to have it working well, you need lots of sensors. This is something that you need to keep in mind. It's not easy to have a robot moving autonomously in areas where people can be or other cars can be. Okay? You need 
to work with data fusion. You need to get data from many different sensors and try to get a better view of what's happening around you. Okay. In this case here, they have a radar, they have a IMU, it's an inertial measurement unit. You have uh, communication, encoders, magnetic sensors, lidars, it's the lasers. You need to fuse all this in order to maneuver there without provoking an accident. When it comes to agriculture, case company made this prototype some two or three years ago, I'm not sure now. But uh, you can see there's no place here for a driver anymore. Okay, so it's changing a lot in places where it's easier to control what's happening around. A harbor, yeah, agriculture field, it's the same. And you have some other challenges. Like this is a motor motorbot, it's from Yamaha, and uh, they are developing a more biker that as should be as good as Valentino Rossi. So Rossi is working with them to make this feasible. There's some movies you can watch too. Good. So now I think you could have an overview of what is happening when it comes to mobile robots trying to become closer to people, trying to become autonomous. Autonomous cars. This is very interesting for us. It's a little bit painful, uh, actually. If you think where we are, my car is here. Zero. There are no autonomous features. Most of the cars in Brazil are here. Ana, is your car here? Maybe. So can you set a uh, cruiser speed? So your car is here. One function. And then two functions at least, and then it goes it goes up to level five. Up to now, we don't have level five. Like if you say um, Tesla cars, Tesla cars are here. Autonomous cars, they are here trying to go to here, but they up to now they are not allowed to do it. Okay, so this is an overview of what is going to happen in the future. And this is one of the biggest problems we have. How can a car that is here deal with a car that is here in the same highway, or even worse, an urban scenario, where kids can walk around, uh, have dogs, you have lots of things happening around you, and you need to detect that. Okay? So this is challenging for us. And uh, I don't believe it will, be, uh, it will happen very fast. It will take some time. But this idea didn't start now, didn't start 10 years ago. It started in the 50s, just after the Second World War. So GM company was having dreams about this, and they made this uh, smart highway with a radio control system that they c you could sit there and uh, go around. Someone was driving your car. okay? And in the newspapers, not in the magazines, back at the time, you have this scene, so they were, I forgot the name of this game. It's, uh, you're building the, the words with uh, the letters, I forgot it. Oh, Sandra is killing me. It's gonna kill me. <laughs> In Portuguese, I think we say palavra cruzada. Yeah, crosswords, okay. And most of the, mo uh, I mean, uh, it started many years ago, and uh, some of the most important universities in the world were in the middle of this. Okay, so Stanford, since the 60s, they were developing autonomous vehicles. Oh, this doesn't look like a car. Yeah, but this was the, they had, uh, it was <laughs> the most advanced thing they had in the 60s. But this is parts of a bicycle. Yeah, it is. But it started here. So it's a long way to go from here to autonomous car. In the 60s, I mean in the 70s, this uh, Japanese university, Tsukuba, they did lots of experiments in Japan. They were able to detect um, the horizontal signs. 
and uh, moved the car at 20 miles per hour in the 70s. In the 80s, the one of the best robotics institute in the world, the Robotics Institute of Carnegie Mellon University, they start to deal with this challenge. For more than 20 years, DARPA invests lots of money in this lab, so they really did a great progress. Here you can see that uh, 11 prototypes were developed in, in 10 years, a little bit more than 10 years. And in Germany also, lots of research were done. In this case, uh, in a partnership with uh, Mercedes-Benz. Uh, uh, of, of course, they were changing the van. <laughs> and you need a van to put all the computers on board. So the computers were huge. It's not what you have today. Okay. Uh, this guy, Alberto Brogi, he came to São Carlos, uh, let me see, six years ago. We invited him to come here, and uh, he spent a week here with the guys in our lab. And we are going to show something very interesting that he did uh, some years ago. But in the 90s, he started to do research on, in this field in the University of Parma, mainly focused on vision systems. Okay. And then it came the DARPA Grand Challenge in 2004. So it was proposed in 2002. It took two years to have some teams that were feeling able to try to do that. Uh, it took place in March 2004 in Mojave Desert. It's close to the border between California and Nevada state. And it was like a 150 miles path. And it's, let me just press here so you can see. Thanks. And the price was two thousand I mean two million US dollars. Uh, probably it won't cover everything that they need to spend developing the cars. Okay? So it was something like this. The path. If you drive by car it take around one hour and a half. They had ten hours to do that. And didn't work. Okay. <laughs> The environment was challenging, so they needed to find a path in the middle of this off-road environment. So the first time they tried to do it, 22 teams applied. Just seven were qualified, but uh, seven was too few, so they gave a chance to have 15 teams. Four overcame eight kilometers after 10, hour. 10 hours. Sorry. So eight kilometers. It's too few, yes, because it was the first time you were facing lots of dif difficulties. One, the temperature. It's not easy to ride autonomous cars in the middle of desert. Desert, sorry, desert. So um, the best one was the red team from C the Robotics Institute from Carnegie Mellow. Uh, they did 11 kilometers. And this guy is like... Uh, uh, one of the best researchers in this area. Uh, many times if you watch Discovery Channel, they have interviews with him, so he's a big star in this field. And have a look how the cars were. We are talking about 15 years ago. Oh, 15 years is a long time. It's uh, not that much. But I wouldn't like to go out with a car like this, with a big radar, lots of sensors around. And it's very interesting because back at that time, we didn't have sensors good enough for this kind of application. So, thanks to DARPA, the companies that developed sensors start to run, try to find new products that could help to do this. Okay, so you have a view of the car. And it didn't work. Uh, a year later, they tried again. They, they reduced uh, the path. They changed it a little bit. But one year later, five teams com could complete the, the path. So it's much better now. Okay. And the first one was from Stanford University, the second from Car I mean the second and third from Carnegie Mellon University, and then this one from a private company, and this another from a private 
private company. You see the times, it changed a lot. So they could learn with the mistakes, they could improve the systems, and even with the same set of sensors, they could complete the path. Okay, and this was the winner, uh, Stanley. So he was in a museum in the US for some time, and uh, Sebastian Trump, he's a German researcher. Um, back at the time, he was in Stanford. After that, he went to Google, he worked a lot for Google, and now I think he started his own company. And the idea was to have a, a set of sensors here that they could combine the different data. So they had GPS, odometry in the wheels. Uh, do you know what odometry is? You can check uh, uh, how the wheel is spinning and uh, convert this in data. So you can plug with the GPS and have a better estimation of your position. You have data from cameras and from the lidars. Lots of lidars here. It was just one layer lidar. So they were extracting information, like cutting layers in front of the car, try to combine that and find a place where the car could move. It was moving slowly, but it worked. Okay. Oh. So those are the cars. And you see, it's not nice. Uh, if you try to drive this car in the middle of a highway, probably you would cause lots of collisions around you because people would say, wow, what is that? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a move about the race, but um, y you watch later. And here you can see the computer is embedded. So it, you can't take a luggage to travel with you, just computers. Okay, the sensors here, lots of uh, red buttons in case of emergency. Emergency, just press the button and uh, everything stops. Okay. And at uh, almost at the same time in Switzerland, we were trying to do the same. So I was there. <laughs> it was true. a great year in FL. Uh, where I did my sabbatical year there, and we had a great group there. These two guys are very famous. Wolfgang, uh, he was a colleague of Sebastian Trump, so they wrote some books together about uh, statistics applied to robotics. And Holland Ziegwald. Holland was here a month and a half ago, and he spent a week here with us. Uh, he was vice president of uh, HH four years ago. And uh, what happened? They had this demo called uh, Europe. And back at that time, the institute was developing a project for European um, Union. Sorry. And we adapt the things. It was this Spark project. It was with su supported by Mercedes-Benz and other European companies. And the idea was to have uh, some sensors embedded in the car and that we could detect the situations and alert the driver. Like a uh, um, uh, truck driver that is sleeping or is getting too close to the front car so it could alert the driver. And we adapt this in three months. It was really crazy thing. It was possible because the companies were helping us. And we had this, uh, let me just take the sound. We had this uh, collaboration between a German university in Freiburg and the Swiss university in IPFL. So for this project, this part project, just one computer was enough. So we were ju having just one laser sensor, just one computer, one camera. We could detect what was happening and alert the driver. It was different. You know, we were not acting, acting in the car. And the project evolved. So if it, in the beginning we are not acting in the car, we start to press the pedals, steer the wheel, and detecting other situations. Okay. And in the end, when uh, we had that uh, Europe in 2006, it was a demonstration for NATO, and uh, we developed this car. So don't try to do this with a smart car. It, smart cars 
were not uh, made to have uh, more than 20 kilograms of sensors on the top. Each one of these is like 5 kilograms. So it's really crazy to do that. And we did the same that people were doing in the US, trying to have sensors in different positions, extracting layers of the air in front of the car, combine that, those layers, and generating free paths for the car. So you see here that we have a GPS, IMU, uh, monocular camera, omni camera, five lidars, and four encoders, one on each wheel. And back at that time, we didn't have a 3D sensor. Later, I'm going to show you the next uh, transparency. Uh, so we made a 3D sensor with two six. This was crazy. You have like uh, 10 kilograms rotating, spinning, spinning, spinning on the top of the car. So don't try to do that. <laughs> and those sensors were very expensive back at the time. It was more than 10,000 euros each one. So based on those uh, layers extracting things around, you could have this view of the things around you and have the distance between the trees and your car, the people were walking around and the things. Okay. And in the end, we went to the uh, demonstration there. It was funny because it was in the middle of nowhere in Germany. It was a NATO uh, camp with lots of uh, those tanks and we were the only civilian car there. Everything was military. And uh, we did the demonstration. Everything that we were acquiring from the environment, we need to send to a, a bunker where there were some NATO generals there checking what was happening. And you have places where they said, OK, think that here you have mines. Here you have fire, so you are not supposed to go that way. So it, it was really funny. But we had a problem. All the setup was carried out during winter, and the demonstration was in spring. So imagine three computers there in a smart car. So the system, we had uh, some heating exchanging problems. OK. <laughs> Good. I'm almost ending this history part. Just after that, start this urban challenge um, from DARPA. So. In November 27, uh, it took place in, again in California, in an Air Force base. And the idea is that uh, they were supposed to complete many paths in a urban scenario in six hours, okay, following the California traffic rules and laws. So this is the point. Autonomous cars should follow the rules, something that we usually don't do it. And I say we, yeah, yeah, even me. Yeah. OK. Uh, 11 teams were qualified for the final, and six could complete the course. From the first challenge to the second one, we had a, a great evolution when it comes to the sensors that we could embed in the car. OK. So um, here you have the six teams. The first one was from Carnage Mello second one from Stanford, and the third one from Virginia Tech. MIT was the fourth place. But the big difference, MIT guys didn't have any help from the companies. This is their style, the, the way they like to work. Uh, the three ones here, lots of companies helping them to develop the, the cars. And those are the two, let's say, winners. Now the first and the second place, Junior and Boss. This guy here was a big evolution. Because instead of having like these three guys, just one layer, the six sensor, there I had 64 layers. Wow, that's great. Yes, it's great. And a great quantity of data that you need to deal in real time. So a big problem. OK? <laughs> so uh, it, it's, it's uh, like they say, a blast and a curse. <laughs> You, you have lots of data, and you need to extract information from that data. And this can become very painful. And you can see that most of the cars, they had the Velodyne sensor. And it was uh, very expensive, around 65, 68,000 
dollars. Okay. And one thing that is interesting for you to note is that uh, the quantum of sensors they had close to the bumpers. Because imagine you are in an urban scenario, you are arriving in an intersection, you need to know what's happening on your left side, the front of you, in your right side, oh, so, oh, oh, left, <laughs> right, in front of you, to take a decision. Following the rules, you need to take a decision. Okay, I should stay here because another car is coming or whatever. You need to detect pedestrians, dogs, and you know. So, uh, the need of processing power and sensors in this kind of application is much higher than previously. You were in an off-road environment, so no problem concerning things around you. Just to find a way and go in your path. Here, no. Here, you need to interact with things around you. Okay? So, lots of different sensors, even because they could face a situation where one of the sensors, let's say, the Velodyne doesn't work anymore, so they ne need to have a second option. Okay. Oh. Then it comes Alberto Brogi, that I told you, the Italian guy that came here. So they, uh, he did a, a great thing. Uh, Chinese people hired him to run a demonstration to go from Parma to Shanghai. This was in 2010. I don't know if you remember 2010. Uh, there were some uh, volcanoes erupting in Norway, somewhere there. And this became a big problem for him because he, were, he was buying things to assemble the cars. And uh, he had a huge delay. The point is that for Chinese people, 10 is a magic number. So he really needed to arrive there in October 10, 2010. He was hired for that. Okay? And if he had, he had a delay here, so oof, a huge problem. So it took around three months for him to cross all these countries and arrive in China. And uh, they did. It was a great success. And how did they do that? All the path, during all the path, one, at least one car was moving autonomously. But the trick is, he had four cars. And he wasn't doing really autonomously. He was having something like, we call, master slave. So, people of the lab is driving this car, sending data to this one, so he's following what this is doing. And here, it's the same. Okay. They could acquire lots of data, and, uh, well, it was very interesting. He was in the news for many time back in 2010. Okay? And we are talking about 13,000 kilometers. It's not, it's not easy. Uh, I think he, they, were, they were trying to do that uh, the Silk Way that Chinese used a thousand of years ago. But in some countries, they were not allowed to enter. So they need to go and go up and trying to avoid problems. Good. So when it comes to the his history, that's what we have. Uh, what we are doing in the project here, uh, the project has around 10 years. Now we are not so focused on autonomous cars anymore. We did lots of things. Now we are moving to agriculture applications. But the setup is very similar to the ones that people use there. So we have uh, these laser sensors with four layers in the front exactly in their in to help us in the intersections. Uh, the Velodyne, not with 64 layers, but with 32, it's half of the price, half of the quantum of data, so <laughs> half of the problem. Uh, we have cameras, thermal cameras, CCD cameras, and we have this uh, localization system with, uh, uh, instead of using odometry, the, uh, a sensor, exactly for odometry, we are using the sensors for the EBS system, the IMU and the uh, GPS system that we can merge all the data. Okay, so we did lots of experiments of the car. Here you can see the setup. It's, it doesn't look beautiful, for sure. It doesn't look beautiful, but uh, everything is calibrated. So this is important when it comes to 
do research in this field, you need to a, a very good calibration. Otherwise, you don't have a good data. Okay. Uh, we made some experiments in Campus 2 here. We made experiments extracting fixtures around you. This is what the sensor, the Velodyne sensor sees. Maybe you, you can see from back there, this uh, green dots here. So it's an area that I can navigate the car. And the red ones are too high, like I uh, say too high, more than um, 13 centimeters. So I am not supposed to go in that direction because I'm going to hit something. But it's not only about hitting something. You need to understand what that thing is. Okay. This is uh, some experiments we did in Federal University of São Carlos with the system for auto localization uh, based on ABS sensors, the GPS, and the others, and the campus too. too. Let me just go here. And when it comes to the Velodyne, uh, you can see it's not a, a chip sensor. The range is between 80 meters to 100 meters, so it's not that much. For a highway, don't, you can't trust on this. For a urban scenario, yeah, you can do something. Your, your speed is around 20, 30 kilometers hour, 40 kilometers hour, that's OK. Um, and uh, the accuracy, more or less, 2 centimeters. And you can change uh, the frequency that you are carrying the data. OK, so let me see here. I'm not going to show you all the movie, but just for you to have an idea, this we did some years ago. Oops. So uh, the goal was to try to generate maps to navigate the car. Uh, go. And just go a little bit here. So this is what you have there. We acquire the data, then we analyze the data. You can see that you, are, you have uh, areas behind the obstacles that you don't know what's happening. You need to use uh, some filters to predict what that obstacle is going to do in the next time window, let's say in one second, two seconds, to predict the movement of that obstacle and uh, generate paths for your car based on those movements. Okay, you need to cluster the data. Like, uh, okay, this is uh, another car. This is a person. This is a tree. You need to under uh, here. You have two people here, so you need to understand those and have models for those. Like a human, you can't predict if the person is gonna walk just one direction. Oh no, I can. Oh, I'm wrong. I want to walk. But a car is easier for you to predict what's gonna happen in the next one second because you're going to steer the car based on the speed of the car. So you can have an area around the car that you can say, OK, maybe the car will turn left, right, or go straight ahead. So everything you need to do in real time. And uh, don't forget, you need to use the actuators to steer the wheels and uh, um, use the pedals. So everything needs to be faster than a, a person. And this is a challenge. Especially if you're talking about moving in a highway. So the speed is very big there. OK. Good. Um, I need to run. So this is where we are now. If you think about uh, the change that's happening, start some years ago. We I said to you, starting 2004, when DARPA decided to make that challenge. But from here, we have many more companies work on that. So today, if you look around in the big universities in the world, few universities are still doing research focused on autonomous cars. Because this is being done inside the companies now. The companies have their suppliers that are developing sensors that you can embed, and you don't see them anymore. You're going to see this. <laughs> OK, so this is moving. And the tendency is that uh, after 2026, things will be start to be implemented in the US or Europe. Oh. OK, so we are here. Phase number two, OK, a limited driver substitution. That's exactly what is happening. 
So the next step is to have a complete autonomous capability. I don't believe this is going to happen before. Oh, there's a 2021 here. There's one missing. I don't think it's going to happen really in urban scenarios, but in highways, yeah. Some places, yes. Okay. You see, big companies, California did something very smart some years ago. They decided to have a, a free space for companies that want to develop autonomous cars. So many companies moved there and started to having uh, facilities and make some research centers. Today, the situation in the US is a little bit different. More states are uh, allowing this kind of tests. Okay. It, almost the same happened some years ago in Australia when it comes to drones. So things that uh, people were not allowed to do in the US or Europe, they were, were allowed to do it in, in, in Australia. So companies moved to Australia to run experiments when it comes to drones. The big players today are those. So we have GM, Ford, Uber, Lyft, Waymo. And when I, we say big players, they are really big players. They invest in billions of dollars on that. And this is what you have today from Uber. Okay, the, the car is from Ford Company, but you have uh, the set of sensors here and the computers embedded. Probably you heard that um, Uber had some problems some years ago, but things are moving. Uh, you see Velodyne is still here. And this is changing completely. You have new sensors coming. So the idea is to don't have this anymore. Take this away in a way that uh, people you think the car is not autonomous and you'll be more attractive for our eyes. <laughs> OK, so um, when it comes to Waymo, Waymo, do you know Waymo company? It's from Google. It's from Alphabet Group. So uh, you have in Google Campus these small cars, and uh, I, f I think in San Francisco you have the others from IMO too. So it's looking better now. Uh, this was a partnership with a Chrysler Company. You see, it's almost the same set of sensors. Uh, Today, in the US, you can hire a company to prepare the set of sensors for you to develop uh, algorithms. There's a company from Illinois. I don't remember exactly the name of the company, but uh, you can buy the set. They adapt the set to the car that you want, and they plug everything in the embedded CAN network, so you can really control the car. Uh, the quantity of hours without uh, the intervention of humans is rising. See, 2015 you had like 5,500 kilometers without the need of a driver to make something to avoid an accident. In 2017 it was like 9,000, and now I don't have the last data here, but I know that's increasing uh, based on what we hear in the Congress. And this Tesla. Tesla, I think all of you know. Tesla. Tesla don't, is not uh, autonomous cars. They have, <coughs> they have this autopilot. Okay? They have this called ADAS. ADAS stands for Advanced Driver Assistance System. So uh, you can turn it on, you do other things, and it's driving your car. Actually, if it detects a situation where uh, an accident is imminent, it can also take the control of the car and try to avoid the accident. Sometimes it works, sometimes it's not possible, even for a driver. Sometimes you're in a kind of situation that uh, there's nothing you can do to avoid the accident. Okay. And uh, maybe you can see from back there, this is the car and like a real scale, the range of the sensors. And when it comes to Tesla, you have a radar here, 160 meters. Today, there are radars, even better radars, that you can have a larger range. And this is the point. Highways, a laser or vision system won't work. 
you need to have radars. And combine this with the others, the other sensors, and extract information to maneuver your car. Okay? So that's the car. Uh, this one I want to show you. I hope it will work. Mm. Could you hear this? This is the noise when the autopilot is changing the path, trying to avoid an accident. So it detects the situation with a, a, a good range, a good distance. So you see, uh, it works pretty well. The point is that the news don't like to give good news. They like to show accidents where it was not possible, when it was not possible to avoid an accident and uh, you had a, ca a casualty. Oops. But uh, it works pretty well. Let's see, let me come back here. And of course, uh, you had lots of uh, propaganda about this. You have the, the Starman driver going to Mars. But this is nice to see the evolution. 110 years. It's huge, huge evolution. Okay. As I told you, it's a race. Um, it's not for beginners. You have the big companies. And from my opinion and the opinion of many research that I'm touched with, uh, this is going to change the business model of the auto car companies. Maybe we are not going to buy cars anymore. I don't want to be uh, the owner of a car. I want to have an autonomous car that can go any place I want, when I want, to pick me up and take me to another place. Things are changing a lot. And uh, it, it, I would say it's not only a race, but it's a war. <laughs> the companies are trying to avoid that. Uh, some. I think uh, a month ago I was in Brasilia with that uh, 20 hot uh, 2030 the 20 30 route, uh, having the, the meetings there in Brasilia. And uh, people from the automakers, automaker companies and uh, the suppliers were talking about this. The business model is changing. The big companies don't like, but it's changing. Especially in Brazil, where we pay so many taxes to have a car, so <laughs> it's really painful. Uh, you can see here that uh, self-driving cars test in the US uh, where the miles driving in California, so it's, you talk about Uber, you are talking about more than one million miles. So they, it's the way that you need to follow to solve all the bugs you have in the, in the programs your software. You need to run, run, run in real environments, detect situations that uh, you, you didn't think previously about that. You need to solve the problems. So this is from Hyundai. This is Hyundai Nexus. Uh, can you see the sensors? So this is the next generation. According to the news, uh, today they have a little bit more than five prototypes. This was 2018. So it's uh, use uh, hydrogen cells in South Korea. Back at that time, more than 190 kilograms in highways. Okay? Maximum speed of 110 kilometers an hour. And with the companies, you have all the sensors embedded here and you don't see them. This is the difference. Where things are really becoming, uh, not, not a dream anymore, but it's becoming true. Uh, it's not in the same scale like uh, the one that I had from Uber, 
I mean, from, from Tesla. But it's the same idea, radars in the front, radars on the sides. You need to detect everything that's happening around you. Okay, and this is a key issue that we need to deal with. How to detect, how to classify the things, how to predict what that person or that motor biker, that biker or the dog is going to do in the next uh, time window. And maybe the most challenging one, if you see a ball coming in the middle of the, the street, oh, maybe there's a kid coming. Because it's, it's so natural for us when we are driving, you see a, a red ball coming, pom, 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 oops, kids can be around. So I slow down. The car maybe won't do it. So according to Hyundai in 2021, it will be in the market. But now they are already saying 2030. It's not easy, <laughs> even for Hyundai. And now you see the difference. The Carnage Mellow Boss, 2007 to Hyundai, 11 years past, and all this disappeared. Actually, it doesn't didn't disappear, it's there. But thanks to the um, partnership with the companies that make the sensors, it was, uh, they were able to embed the car and you don't see them anymore. And the other thing that's important, when you are doing research, that's, that's what we were doing here, you need to have lots of computers and process data. Send everything to the computer and then try to understand what's happening. Here, no. You have the electronic plates, together with the sensor, so it extracts the information you need and send only that information to the computer to take a decision. So it saves you time, saves you mo uh, memory, and makes your life easier. Okay, so uh, as I said, it's a race. Waymo now has a partnership with Renault Nissan to have autonomous cars in France and Japan. You had lots of Lego battles, like uh, Uber and Waymo. Uh, you have employees from one company moving to the other company, and maybe they are taking part of the code. So this is tricky. Uh, you have lots of investigations, like here in Tesla, as I told you, uh, many times you've seen in the news things about Tesla company, Tesla cars having accidents. You have this um, level two cars, fatalities. So, oops, ah, here. Tesla, 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 Tesla. But you can click there and check uh, the reports. Like this one, this was the last one, was March 2019. Uh, and uh, it was one of the situations that maybe if there was a driver there, he, he or she wouldn't be able to avoid the accident. What happened is that uh, uh, there was a truck a combination vehicle slowed as it crossed the southbound lens blocking the Tesla path. So maybe it wasn't possible to avoid it. Later you can check this here. Um, this is the place where it took place. And this was the Tesla car. So it stopped some meters after the accident and the person was killed. Okay. With Uber, you had some accidents too. This is in Arizona, 2017. Just one fatality. It wasn't with the driver. Uh, this was on the news last year. It happened in Arizona, 2018. There was a lady uh, riding a bike, and the Uber detected the lady, but the computer did nothing. So it wasn't uh, a point that uh, the car wasn't able to detect that there was a person there. It, it detected, but there was a bug and it did nothing. One point is that it's much easier to understand why things happened with autonomous cars, because you have all data there. If two autonomous cars crash, you can check both data and say, OK, you are the guilty one very easily. The point is that um, maybe this won't save the life of who was inside. Okay, because of that, uh, Uber cars were grounded for some months, and uh, it's not good for the business. And this is very interesting, is uh, you can, uh, whoa, 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 oh, here. It's uh, in the MIT website, it's about ethics. 
It's something that uh, if you can do it, you are going to feel the problem that the guys that are developing autonomous cars are facing. You need to take decisions. Like here, he gives you this situation. There's no way to avoid the accident. There's no way to stop the car. Who would you kill? This side here, you have uh, one, two kids, um, one uh, middle-aged lady, a fat lady, another lady here, or oh, just girls, boys. Who are you going to kill? So you run this, this form, there are many, many questions, and then you fill the form with your data. In the end, it shows you where you are and uh, the tendency of what we are doing. And in this case here, you can kill who is inside the car. Would you buy a, a car from a company that uh, tells you that instead of killing pedestrians, it's going to kill you? <laughs> so, difficult questions. But we need to face these questions. Okay? And then there are many situations. Pregnant woman, uh, just uh, old people, young people. <laughs> Run this. You're going to like. So challenges that we have is to take decisions in real time respecting local traffic rules. This is a big challenge for the companies. Because in the US, in Belgium, in Brazil, um, Germany, the rules are different. And not only the rules, but also, um, oops, one more here. Also, the road signs and markings, they are completely different. Some uh, months ago, we were, some people from Volkswagen was, uh, they were contacting us to try to help them to deal with this in Brazil because uh, it's too expensive for them to solve this in Germany and they need to solve this for Latin American market. They have many things there for your European cars but not from for our market here. Okay, So it's not just I, I bought a car from Europe, it may be the autonomous car won't work that well here. And another challenge. This looks like São Carlos. <laughs> uh, but this is in England. So it's not only in São Carlos that we have this big, big, uh, like uh, off-road scenario. This is a challenge. You think that, just match the situation. The rain just stopped. All these potholes are filled with water. Can the car detect those? So it, it, it's hard. And traffic jams. So I didn't know Bogota was the number two in the rank, but <laughs> it was a surprise for me. Um, how to deal with cars that are not autonomous when people don't follow the rules. And this change completed from country to country even from city to city. Uh, some years ago I was in Belo Horizonte and the, the way they drive there is completely different from the way I drive here. So, uh, like, wow, what these guys are doing here? Okay, so it, it's hard to do this with this. Oh. Okay, uh, I'm almost ending. Uh, so this was the one, almost the end of the talk of Professor Holland Siegwert uh, some two months ago. And he was showing this part here about oh, autonomous cars. So they believe that uh, in urban scenarios, it would be after 2030. This is already feasible to do. It's expensive, yes. But we, we already can do that. Oh. And if you want to know more about robots, just go to IEEE Spectrum or the website, Facebook. Lots of news about robots there. Every week they have new movies, crazy things. It's very good for you. Some partners that we have. And thank you for your attention. Oh, I, sorry, one minute. I passed one minute. OK, thank you. Thank you, Marcelo, for your interesting presentation.
Uh, so, do we have questions? No, Professor Widmer. In Portuguese, someone? Okay. So, thank you very much. Again.